As I've alluded to a number of times actually in this series, there are certain cars which are victims of hubris, or sometimes just companies deciding for whatever arbitrary reason, usually, that the public doesn't deserve access, it would seem, to their amazing, flashy supercar concepts. But there are other times where it's justifiable. You can understand why a car faded into obscurity, or why it comparatively speaking, failed, if you will. Now, this is one of those unfortunate occasions where the car did have good intentions, the people producing it had good intentions, and it could have actually been a very significant car, especially for the region where it comes from. Because this car, the MTX Tatra V8, sometimes people like to reverse the names and call it the Tatra MTX, it doesn't matter too much because it's two different companies working together. Sometimes the car is called the V8, sometimes the V8i. The point is, it's all the same thing. Now, both of those companies are Czech. MTX, who you probably aren't as familiar with, have more of a performance and motorsport kind of inkling. They used to build uh, single-seater racers, tuning up and repairing Skodas. They even made some Skoda-based models, some convertibles. And Tatra, on the other hand, you've probably tangentially seen or heard of at least some of their models. Now, Tatra, although not a company that I talk about a huge amount, is a very significant one in the car world because they're the third oldest car company in the world to have a continuous, unbroken production of vehicles. That's pretty remarkable, given that we don't talk about them that much, if at all, usually on the channel. They were actually founded in 1850. They didn't, of course, start producing cars until much later, around the eight, late 1890s. They were renamed in around, I think it was 1919 or so, and then around 1990, they decided to team up with MTX to build a Czech supercar. And that is this vehicle, the V8i, or just the V8. So what does the car offer? And why are we talking about it? Well, first things first, let's look at the car. As doubtless you already have been, I personally think this is a great looking vehicle. And in a funny kind of way, it actually looks kind of like a lot of British cars of the time, some a little bit earlier, some a little bit later, put together. The front end is kind of Lotus Esprit-esque, the back end is very Lister Storm-esque, and even the overall shape, but the cockpit in particular, kind of has a bit of a an XJ220 meets McLaren F1 kind of vibe to it. But you could also say, of course, you've got stuff like a bit of Shizetta in there, a bit of Bugatti EB110. But the point is, if you can liken a car that most people have never heard of to those kind of vehicles, that's a pretty good sign. If it looks like those cars at least, that's a good start. I personally think this is a great looking car, probably even one of the best designs of this series. It's not so much oddball, it's just forgotten. It's not a crazy car in that kind of sense. Now, as the name suggests, it is powered by a V8 engine. It's a 3.9 litre, and it's naturally aspirated. It puts out just over 300 horsepower, which is <laughs> probably not quite as much as you were hoping for. You would probably expect, say, 450, maybe 500, given that it is the early 90s, after all. But the point is... Even with 302 horsepower, this car, which incidentally only weighs 1,350 kilos, which is about the same as some GT3 class race cars from around, say, 2010 or so, can do 165 miles per hour. That is really impressive for a car that has less power, for instance, than a Mustang GT to be that quick. I think that's got pretty amazing potential. Now, the acceleration isn't quite as impressive. It's about five and a half seconds to 60, but still, a lot of supercars weren't as quick for acceleration in the early 90s anyway. Which, of course, is why vehicles like the Door 962, and especially the McLaren F1, stood out so much. Now, as far as the production side of things, that is unfortunately where it gets a little bit more sketchy in the case of the V8. Because they showed the car at the Prague Motor Show in 1991, and they had 200 orders placed of people who wanted to buy one. That's pretty great for any supercar, let alone a Czech one. But they did actually plan to produce 100, which would still be a very, very ambitious goal for a company or companies who aren't exactly known for that sort of thing from a place in the world that isn't exactly known for that kind of thing and still isn't really. However, this is where it gets unfortunate and actually kind of sad. Only four cars were ever built. And that's not the sad thing. The sad thing is that 
very early on in the production stages, they actually sold the rights to produce the car to a different company. And then the factory that was going to produce them burned down and took all of the remaining parts with it. And unfortunately, for financial reasons, understandably so, they never built any more. That is such a shame. And stuff like that is the kind of thing that you would think would happen in, say, a car movie, but not so much in real life. Things like that don't happen as often as you might expect, but it's such a sad thing when a car, as I said, that had great potential, the company had great intentions, it looked like they were really trying to make a good supercar, not as fast as Europe, or at least other parts of Europe, but... Still, it would have been a cool car at the very least, and it would have definitely been the fastest Czech car around. It's such a shame, though, that only four were ever built. Now, of the four that were produced, there's one in red, one in white, which I believe are still owned by Czech owners privately. There is a black one, at least according to Wikipedia at the time, that is in a sports museum, or a sports car museum, I should say. And here's the interesting thing, and this is the way that most Western petrol heads will have probably seen the car, if you're a fan of Kanye West, that is, kind of a strange connection, but bear with me, because one V8 was delivered to America, and it was featured in the music video of Runaway by Kanye West. Now, personally, I didn't see the car there, because I'm not a Kanye West fan, didn't see the video, but for anyone who did, there's a black car in that video that you probably thought, wait a second, what is that? Is that a Lambo? Is that a Bugatti? Is that a McLaren of some kind? No, it's an MTX Tatra V8i, one of only four in the world. So it's a car which actually, in a weird kind of way, actually did get a ton of exposure from the people watching that music video, and yet at the same time it's still super obscure, ironically, because people still didn't actually know what it was, and petrol heads would probably wonder what it was, people who weren't petrol heads would just assume it's a Lambo or something. So it's kind of a weird scenario where it's really well known, but at the same time really obscure. Not many cars in this series actually have that to their name. So in a funny kind of way, it kind of reminds me of the MG SVR, where that car has this crazy background and controversy surrounding it, which I talked about in my top 50 favourites list featuring that car. This one, on the other hand, not so much in the controversy side of things, but more in just the changing of hands, interesting companies being involved, and then a really unfortunate ending to it all, at least as far as mass production goes. But it is definitely, most definitely, a car that deserves to be in this series. It's pretty much the definition of this series, of course, and it's most definitely one that deserves to be talked about a lot more than it currently is. It's a great-looking car from a place in the world that doesn't typically produce vehicles like this, but given that this was their effort, what a great one. A great little supercar from the early 90s. Had it had maybe 450 or 500 horsepower, it could have quite literally been as fast as some of those much better known names, given that it was already doing 165 miles per hour from 300 horsepower. So imagine what it could have done with more. Probably at least 190, if not the double ton. But that's it overall for this instalment. Of course, if you want to check out a ton of other forgotten, obscure, failed, if you want to say it that way, supercars, race cars, that kind of stuff, then of course you can click through at the end to see all of the previous episodes. But for now, as always, thanks for watching. <laughs>